Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who's tuning in. Hope you're doing well and staying safe. On behalf of Pio Petro, Arab Oil and Gas Academy, Arab Goro, SPE Egypt section, I'd like to welcome you all for our today's session, the introduction to underground hydrocarbon storage. I am my art daughter, third year gas and petrochemical engineer student at Alexandria University, and I'll be your moderator for today. Before we start, please, I'd like to, to remind you to drop your questions in the Q&A section below and to keep the chat box professional and ethical. Now, without further ado, let us give a warm welcome to engineer Zachary Evans. Engineer Zachary Evans is the reservoir storage manager for WSP, a leader in the underground energy storage consulting, Engineer Evans has over 13 years of reservoir gas storage experience, having spent the majority of his career as a, as a senior storage engineer for the Columbia Gas, TC Energy family of companies operating storage fields in the Appalachian Basin. Engineer Zachary currently serves on the Southern Gas Association's Underground Storage Committee, is a two-time chair of the SGA's Underground Storage Roundtable and is a member of the Society of Petroleum Engineers International Board as the Regional Director of North America. Engineer Zachary, thank you so much for coming today and the, and the mic is yours. Well, thank you for that introduction and thanks again for the opportunity to speak uh, with your group today. I, um, you know, I've done several presentations like this uh, for Pio Petro, and I, I think this internship program is tremendous. And I'm, I'm glad that uh, all of those in attendance have this opportunity to, to uh, participate in this program. There's a lot of great material, and I hope I can share some information today on underground storage. Um, for the, uh, yeah, for, the uh, for the agenda that we're going to cover today, um, we're going to basically start off and explain the, the basics of underground storage and explain the different types of storage, uh, underground storage facilities and how they're used. Then we'll talk in specifics about salt and hard rock caverns um, and then move into reservoir and aquifers. Basically, those are the two main branches of underground storage facilities. Um, then we're gonna talk about the US natural gas storage market. And I know this is an international audience, but the US gas storage market is a very good case study on um, why uh, underground storage is a useful business model and why it's very critical to energy infrastructure. So we're gonna use that as an example that you can apply all around the world because it explains the economics. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about the future of underground storage, talk about some different uses that are becoming more prominent, talk a little bit about strategic reserves and things like that. And at the end, I'm happy to take any questions um, and, and follow up with anyone after the presentation if they wanna discuss more. Um, a little bit of background about myself, um, uh, other than the introduction that was already given. I am a petroleum engineer by trade, and I've spent about 20 years in the industry now, getting close to 20 years. I started my career uh, with Schlumberger as an MWD, LWD engineer. I actually started in Saudi Arabia. I spent a year there, I spent a year and a half in Malaysia, and then finished with just under a year in Australia. So I had a great opportunity to uh, visit a variety of locations around the world and start working offshore. So I have that uh, experience. Uh, from, from years ago, but I spent the majority of my career in underground storage um, here in uh, West Virginia, which is where I live in the United States. Um, this area of the U.S. has a lot of gas storage, which we'll talk about. Um, and the company I used to work for, which was called Columbia Gas, and it's now called TC Energy, um, was the operator of the most storage assets, no, largest number of fields and wells in the entire continent of North America. I currently work for a consulting company, which does the same, same kind of storage work, but just as a consultant rather than an operator. And then, uh, as was mentioned, I do also come today as a representative of SPE. Um, I hope everyone is participating in SPE at their respective locations, uh, as I currently sit on the board and happy to uh, represent the organization. So let's talk about underground storage. I will say for those of you who may have had the um, uh, pleasure of, of listening to my presentation before, there's going to be a lot of the same material. We are going to cover a little bit of new um, discussion points at the end in terms of hydrogen and carbon. But, um, you know, it's pretty much the same, same thing, but it's always good, I think, to, to re reiterate. Um, so underground storage is effectively using underground geologic formations to store some kind of fluid, whether it's a liquid or a gas, and it can be a hydrocarbon or it can be some non-hydrocarbon liquid. Um, but basically, it's using that underground storage space um, to store a commodity during times of overproduction for use in periods of high, high demand 
so that you can provide um, basically uninterrupted service. You can take advantage of pricing, um, you know, highs and lows, and, and generally just uh, support a reliability model um, for whatever commodity you're storing. So it's as simple as that. We're not storing in underground tanks. We are not uh, doing anything like that. It's using the reservoirs or using the geologic caverns that are available to store some critical commodity. Now, when we're talking the specifics about how we can use underground storage, the biggest is hydrocarbon storage, and the biggest of those is natural gas. So most of your uh, storage space around the globe is occupied by natural gas molecules. You can also store crude oil. Um, a lot of your strategic reserves will store that, but that's more for cavern use. You can't really take advantage of that in, in the porous media. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You can other, store other refined fuels and NGLs. Um, so basically any kind of, of petrochemical product that you want to store um, again, there's no, there's no specificity on which kind of liquid it, it, it applies for pretty much all cases, LNGs as well. Now, when we talk about other gases, uh, hydrogen is obviously becoming a big issue where there's a few facilities in the country that store hydrogen currently, no proof of concept yet on reservoirs, uh, but there's also helium. So in the U.S., we have a strategic reserve for helium. And with the, uh, the newfound space race, as a lot of people are, are um, venturing more into uh, aeronautics and um, space travel. Helium is a critical component for that, so it's become more, more critical. Compressed air is basically storing heated air in the ground and then uh, withdrawing it and taking that thermal energy as a source of power generation. Um, and then disposal. So we're talking. the other thing we talked about before is about storing something and then recycling it back out um, as, a, as a full service. Um, disposal, we're essentially putting things in the ground and leaving them there for the duration, whether that's brine or other kinds of oil field and industrial waste or carbon sequestration, which is essentially long-term storage and disposal of carbon. So who owns these facilities and who operates them? So uh, this is obviously um, a broad answer. There's a lot of different entities that do this, a lot of different places around the world, but your big, uh, most of your storage owners and operators are going to be pipeline companies and independent storage companies that are designed to transport natural gas or transport hydrocarbons or something of that nature. And storage provides that additional service, it's additional value add that they can put onto their business model. And it provides that flexibility and reliability. Utility companies themselves, a lot of um, power generation utilities will own their own storage because that allows them to back up their own system in case of supply and demand um, challenges. Um, producers can hold their own storage for their own purposes. You know, obviously if they're producing the oil and gas um, they can store it uh, on their own system without paying a third party. Midstream companies, refineries that do more of the processing. Um, and then finally, national governments can, can own and operate storage uh, specifically in the form of strategic reserves to make sure that the economic impact of a shortage is not felt by the, the national economy. So when we talk about the types of underground storage, there's basically four major, four major categories. The first and most effective is salt caverns, and that's when you take a domal salt deposit that's underneath the, uh, or that's in the uh, stratigraphic column, and you um, mine out a, uh, using a, a technique we'll talk about in the future called solution mining, to hollow out a void space, and then you store um, your liquid in that. Um, salt caverns are the most effective because it's a single well most often. It's a very high rate of delivery and very high volume, high pressure um, capacity, but um, you're limited by salt deposition and there is not salt geologically present everywhere in the world. So that's a, a limiting factor that not every um, country and every part of every country um, is, uh, has a convenient location for. Depleted reservoirs are the most common type of storage and the most high volume in terms of the total volume of storage around the, the globe is mostly in depleted reservoirs and it's exactly what it sounds like. It is uh, storage in uh, uh, geologic formations that previously held naturally occurring hydrocarbons. And after you've produced all those, it got to economic breakover point where it's no longer uh, feasible to produce, um, you use that void space to store gas or, or store some other kind of, uh, of commodity. Um, aquifers are the exact same as depleted reservoirs except instead of having naturally occurring hydrocarbons they had a uh, they were they were filled with water um, and so you take advantage of that water drive although you do have some additional water production and then hard rock caverns are slightly different because it's not a naturally occurring uh, 
um, phenomenon and you're, and you're not using the natural porosity of the, of the geology, what you're doing is essentially mining out a cavern in a traditional mining type environment and then either using a lined or unlined cavern to store your, your fluid in there as well. Um, that's an, that's an, excuse me, an application um, that can be used when you do not have the favorable geology of a depleted reservoir or a salt cavern, um, because you can always, uh, most, almost always find a formation uh, that you can mine out. So we're first going to start about salt caverns. Here's a picture of a salt cavern in the U.S. Gulf Coast. I mean, this is what it looks like. There's not a lot to see on the surface, but there will be a, a salt deposit here. And then each of these wells represents uh, a separate cavern on that salt dome that's been uh, solution mined out that can be used for for storage. Um, so when we talk about uses of hydrocarbons, uh, or, or when we talk about uses of salt caverns for storage, you can basically store any fluid you want. Salt caverns are unique in the fact that the, the physics of the facility allow it to be suitable for both liquids and gases across the entire spectrum. So all of the hydrocarbons we mentioned before are certainly in play, compressed air, hydrogen is a big one. Like I said, that's where a lot of uh, growth is being seen right now. Uh, because of the um, how hydrogen aligns with some uh, emission standards when it comes to um, environmental policy and things like that. And then just like any other facility, you can use it for waste disposal, primarily brine as, as, a, um, as a, a, a targeted waste source. Um, so your operators, we, we talked about who operates storage in general, but in terms of salt specifically, um, the one interesting thing is that outside of the commercial or outside of the energy industry um, operators that we talked about before that make a lot of sense in terms of utilities, the pipeline companies and the, and the refiners, uh, as we discussed, you also with Salt Cavern have the direct salt producers. So when you're um, mining out these uh, facilities, a lot of times it will be done by a company who's actually interested in the salt itself, whether that's for some petrochemical feedstock or whether that's for direct consumption in terms of actual salt for, for household use. Um, so sometimes the salt companies will actually own their own salt caverns and then we'll lease the space um, to other companies as a result. Um, and as we mentioned, the, natural go the national governments as well have that the US Strategic Petroleum Reserve, which is down in the Gulf, um, is, is a salt cavern and is operated by the US Department of Energy. So the reason that the, the salt caverns are so effective is because, as I mentioned, they have a high capacity in terms of volume. They have a high deliverability rate because they can, they can reach a very high pressure. Um, so you can get a lot of flow out of, these, uh, out of these facilities compared to flowing through porous media. And the reason that you can do that is because the salt has a high level of integrity that's not seen in a lot of natural occurring rocks. So if you look on the left here at the, um, the diagram and we're looking at the comparison between um, non-intact salt versus intact salt compared to the traditional perms and porosities of oil reservoirs, you can see that salt in the highlighted range is effectively hard, is more impermeable than granite. I mean, it is effectively impermeable um, and it has very low or essentially de minimis porosity. So it acts as an extremely competent seal um, or, or cap rock for that matter, except in the case of, of, of salt cavern, it's not just a cap rock above the formation, it, it, it circles the entire entirety of the, um, of the facility. Um, and another, another um, advantage of salt over traditional geology is its ability to heal, which means if the salt has been crushed or dilated or otherwise compromised, it can heal itself and re-establish that matrix so that there is no um, conduit for flow um, because of microfracturing or anything like that, or, or, or void space between the poor, or, or poor space between the grains. And the reason that the salt is so effective is that all rocks will do this. All rocks will heal, but uh, salt does it at a much lower temperature and PVT condition than, than traditional rock. I mean, a lot of the rocks that we're talking about in the reservoir, they would heal technically, but it would be at such high temperatures and such high pressures that it would not be feasible. Um, but salt will do that basically under operating conditions. So that's what makes it a very integral um, facility. And as we'll talk later about, or as it kind of goes without saying, um, having that integrity is the key to having a strong or effective storage mechanism. If you, if you, if you don't have good containment, you don't have a good storage container. <laughs> 
Um, so when we talk about the geology of salt caverns, this is some examples, and not every salt dome is the same. Um, so these are some examples of what that salt uh, intrusion may look like underground. The main things I want you to focus on is up here at the top in the two middle of the US Gulf Coast and in Germany, the examples. This is what a traditional salt dome looks like. It will be a molten injection of salt from uh, lower levels of the stratigraphic column up into the geology closer to surface, um, it, kind of like a plume um, for lack of a better word. And then that will create the dome that you will then go in and um, it will displace the other geology. And that's what we will target. Um, down here at the bottom in the middle, you also see what we call bedded salt, which is more of a stratigraphic uh, deposition of salt. Um, in those cases, you can also form a salt cavern, but instead of having a completely integral uh, salt container, you'll have stringers of reservoir rock that will also need to be just as um, integral. So when we talk about constructing and designing and constructing a salt cavern, um, the first thing is, is after we identify the salt dome, we're gonna drill a well uh, from surface into the salt deposit, just like we would drill any other production well or disposal well, that's pretty similar to traditional oil and gas operations. Uh, but then we commence what we call solution mining, also known as leaching. And that's basically the process of using the well bore that we just drilled to pump fresh water. And then that fresh water will then sit in the cavern, it will dissolve the salt. And then that brine, uh, that, that water that now carries that, that salt mineralogy in it will then be pumped to surface. And then that process will be repeated over time until we develop a large enough void space in the rock to develop our salt cavern. Depending on the size of the cavern that you want, it could be anywhere from six to nine months to several years uh, to, to complete this profit, prof process completely and safely. Uh, and then when you're done with that process, um, you, you have the brine that you can either um, give to a direct salt consumption uh, company, as I mentioned before, you can use in chemical processing. There's a lot of industrial processes that use brine as a feedstock, um, or you can dispose of it in porous formations or in salt caverns um, as it, your business model makes sense. When we talk about that leaching process, there's basically two methodologies. One is direct injection in which you're going to um, inject down your hanging string, also known, which is essentially the, the flow string. Um, and then that will uh, allow production of the brine back up the annulus. And because of that pattern, you'll see a growth of the cavern at the bottom, uh, as opposed to the top and reverse injection is injecting through the annulus, producing back up through the main hanging string, the main flow string. And that creates a cavern that is shaped uh, inversely to the direct injection method. And there's a variety of different reasons why you would do one or the other uh, based on um, your localized geology, based on the, um, the targets that you have in terms of size, in terms of what commodity you're storing. Um, but it's interesting to note that how you operate your leaching plant will determine the actual shape of the cavern. And then like with any other mining activity, when you're removing that much uh, material from underground, you will have subsidence. So you will see a physical drop in elevation of the area around the salt cavern. And that needs to be monitored just like you would in a traditional mining operation to make sure that you don't have any damage to your tubulars, you don't have any damage to the cavern itself or any potential damage to surface facilities like piping or any kind of um, uh, non-oil and gas related equipment such as uh, other infrastructure roads and things like that. When we talk about the wells themselves, I had mentioned uh, earlier about the bedded salt. So on the left, we see how you would develop a uh, ideal salt cavern in a domal salt. And you see this is would be after the uh, creation of the cavern, after the leaching is over, you'll see a, uh, a modest amount of fill, also known as the sump, um, down in the bottom of the cavern, which is usually not uh, of any concern. Um, but it's inevitable that you will have some um, residue there and you'll see a nice kind of um, uniform cavern that's developed. But in embedded salt, like I mentioned, the salt is interlaced with different geologic layers. And so you're going to have, as you develop your salt cavern through leaching, you're going to have those, um, even if those stringers don't dissolve, because you're removing the salt, there will be a, a um, uh, they, they'll be essentially fall in. Uh, to the bottom. So you'll see a lot more fill at the bottom that could potentially um, overwhelm your uh, hanging string. So you need to make sure that you uh, clean that out. Um, and also recognizing that when you have this 
cavern of this um, of this shape and of this uh, makeup that you are going to have to make sure that all of those stringers are integral because if any of them could be a service a thief zone then you are going to have some some containment issues long term and then when we talk about the wells themselves, there's three main differences when it comes to a salt cavern storage well compared to a traditional oil and gas well. And the main issues or the main differences are the size of the tubulars, the amount of cement, and the specifics of the completion. So these are very large pipe um, facilities. The flow string of these wells is oftentimes 20 inches or larger. And that's again, because we're pressuring these facilities up to three or 4,000 pounds. Um, they have capacities of four, five, six BCF or more. Um, and a lot of these wells will deliver half a BCF of natural gas in a day. Um, and that's very common and that's very necessary for this specific, specific business model. So you need to make sure that you're not choking off that flow through your flow string. Cement is very critical because when we're talking about storage, we're constantly getting back up, you know, essentially reaching discovery pressure every cycle, right? So we need to make sure that if we are pressuring these things up to 4,000 pounds, that we're not gonna lose containment at the surface. So unlike a lot of production wells that may only have limited cement, they don't have complete returns to surface, especially older wells that may be converted to storage, salt cavern needs to have full, um, every string needs to be fully submitted to surface. And then the completion is slightly different in the sense that we do have hanging strings here, which means there is a, um, uh, you know, uh, basically a tubing string, um, or it acts as a tubing string that's not cemented in that will allow for that angular flow. But in this case, again, that tubing is effectively, you know, surface casing for a lot of traditional oil and gas wells because of the size difference. So similar drilling engineering, similar casing design in, in theory, but in practice, it's a lot different just because of those specifics that I mentioned. Here's a 3D rendering of an example of a, of a salt cavern. So you can see, well, it's not a perfect you know, cylinder. It certainly approaches that. And then this also shows some the ranges we're talking here in terms of your capacities that can be very, uh, they can vary in terms of size to from, from reasonably small to incredibly large. These facilities can be at a variety of different depths, some shallow as close to a thousand feet, some several thousand feet. And then the height of the cavern itself, as well as the width, it can be a couple hundred feet by, by um, double digit feet in width, or it can be extremely deep, you know, um, in terms of its height, as well as its width. So it's it really the point to take away here is that it, there's a lot of variance, um, both in terms of how your gel, how your specific salt responds to the leaching process, and based on what your commercial needs are, because you need to develop a cavern that's as big as you need and you don't need to necessarily develop um, larger capacity because it might cause a problem if it's unnecessary. When we talk about where salt exists around the world, you can see in the US, it's pretty much this corridor from the US Gulf Coast up through the mi middle of the country in the Rocky Mountains up into uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and into Northern Canada. Then you have a big deposit over here in central um, uh, Russia and Siberia. There's a lot of salt up around basically from the North Sea over to the Gulf of Finland in Northern Europe, around the Mediterranean and even into the Middle East uh, along the, uh, the Gulf and uh, over here um, between uh, Saudi and Egypt as well. Um, so there's the main takeaway here is there's a lot of salt dep deposits around the world, but you also see some areas where there just isn't any salt. So what we just talked about isn't applicable for a lot of geographic regions. And that's why we have to have other, other kinds. So when we talk about global development of salt, the big leaders in salt development outside of the U.S. are in mainland Europe, specifically in Germany and Netherlands, but also the French and the Polish governments have been pursuing that for a long time. So those are basically your two big leaders in terms of salt cavern historically. Um, in recent years, both Russia and China have really increased the amount of internal salt cavern storage that they have developed. But unfortunately, you know, specifics on numbers are not available as you can imagine based on those two uh, governments. And then based on the change in markets and the, and the need for reliability, which is the big driver for storage these days, we've seen a lot of activity with traditional petro states, especially in the Middle East, with both Adnoc and Saudi Aramco in the last three years, really uh, diving into storage, um, despite having essentially no storage up until um, that time. So a lot of uh, salt cavern storage around the world, 
Now let's talk about Hard Rock Caverns. Now I want to uh, preface that though my company does a lot of work with Hard Rock Caverns, I am not a Hard Rock expert. Uh, that's more of a mining uh, type of discipline, but I did want to share this with everybody just so that you're aware of it. Um, so basically, as I mentioned before, uh, hard rock caverns or mine caverns, as they're often called, are essentially room and pillar mines that have been developed either previously and were converted to storage or were developed specifically for the storage purpose that, are, that use existing geology, usually very shallow uh, compared to some of the other reservoir and salt caverns that we, we were talking about. Um, to essentially create that same void space that we see in a salt cavern, but to do that mechanically through mining efforts. Um, we primarily use hard rock caverns for liquid storage. Like we said, we can either line them or leave them natural. Um, use, uh, storing them for, for gases is somewhat complicated because it's very hard to maintain that integrity that we talked about being so important. Um, but basically, this allows folks who do not have the geology of a depleted reservoir or of a salt deposit, but still have commercial needs for this. Imagine if you have a refinery or a, a power plant or something like that that's very isolated geologically, they still have the need for storage that exceeds their ca capacity to build on surface storage, like in tanks and things like that. They can still mine out a hard rock cavern and take advantage of that. Actually, here where I sit in West Virginia, just about 45 minutes down the road, there's a refinery that, that installed um, a refined liquids um, cavern, exactly what we're talking about. So it's, there's a lot of them around the, around the country, around the world that you wouldn't even think about. Um, for example, in India, their National Strategic Petroleum Reserve is a hard rock, is a series of hard rock uh, mined caverns. So it's very interesting. Um, we'll just show a couple pictures here, what we're talking about. This is what we're we're discussing when we're saying mining. It's not, not exactly the same kind of coal mining operation, but it's very similar to that. Here you can see some of the equipment and, and what we're talking about. Um, and then when we talk about it from a design standpoint, usually you're going to drill an access shaft that's down. And then the actual storage capacity is going to be developed in these horizontal parallel um, shafts um, that are then going to be connected. And then um, from that connection, then flown to surface so that you can um, retrieve whatever commodity you're storing and then support whatever commercial operation on the surface uh, that you have there. Um, so that's hard rock caverns. It's a good option when you don't have the, the luxury of the others. Um, like I said, the main thing there is that it's, it, those are relatively shallow and much smaller than the other two. Um, here, now we're going to talk about my specialty, which is reservoir and aquifer storage. This is a storage facility out in California. And as you can see, oftentimes it's very close to culture um, and it's not a lot of surface facilities. As you can see, most of the time in the US people will live near or drive past storage facilities and have no idea that they're there um, because it's uh, very much overlooked and, and not recognized. Um, so when we talk about the uses for reservoir storage, obviously the majority of the uses is for natural gas storage because in many cases, it, it, it housed the natural gas originally, so it makes a it's a perfect application to store it um, after the fact as a as a storage application. Um, there has been some discussion about storage of crude oil, but that's completely theoretical, especially here in the U.S. Last spring, when we saw a storage get overwhelmed and oil futures actually went negative. If you remember that month when oil cost negative thirty dollars. Um, there was a discussion, in fact, my, my company was involved with some discussions with the Department of Energy on that, um, about developing additional storage capacity in reservoirs. But the problem is, as you can imagine, storing a liquid in a porous media environment, you do worry about how much, what your recovery factor is. And it's not incredibly efficient in terms of delivery rates. And so you wonder sometimes, even if it is physically possible, is it going to be viable in terms of its effectiveness. Um, we talked about the other gases you could store. Hydrogen storage has not been, has not been um, proven in uh, depleted reservoirs uh, currently. It's um, only a um, theoretical discussion at this point. It has been stored in salt caverns. We just haven't gone to proof of concept in reservoirs. And the reason is, is because hydrogen molecules are about one-tenth the size of um, uh, methane molecule, molecules and unlike hydrocarbons, he, hydrogen is not inert, right? So it has, there's questions about its long-term chemical reactions, not just with the um, tubulars because hydrogen embrittlement is a big issue, uh, both in piping, surface piping and in the casings, 
but as well as reactivity with um, uh, reservoir fluids, as well as the reservoir matrix itself. There's a lot of sulfurization. There's a lot of concerns about possibly uh, contaminating the cap rock. Um, so that's a future work that a lot of people are studying right now, um, but it hasn't been uh, uh, proven. Helium, we mentioned that, that that's another storage uh, of a critical um, uh, commodity. And then more commonly now, we're seeing carbon sequestration become a, uh, a, to a hot topic and a more practical, uh, uh, well, it's just a more common business model at this point. And then water disposal. So you can disp dispose of a lot of uh, oil field waste and other industrial waste in terms of water. So the operators of uh, depleted reservoirs are basically the, all of the same companies we mentioned. It's just anyone who wants to store a gaseous uh, fluid uh, as opposed to a, a liquid. So basically anybody who's involved in uh, gas-fired power generation, who's involved in the distribution of natural gas for residential and industrial purposes, and again, any national interest or other public sector interest um, that is worried about economic impacts of a shortfall or other lack of, uh, uh, or in interruption of service. So when we talk about reservoir storage, especially here in the US, it's important to recognize that majority of your natural gas reservoir storage facilities were just production fields that once they reached the end of their production life were converted as is to storage facilities. So there are very few storage facilities around the world that were developed specifically for use in storage. Usually they were developed for exploration and production purposes. And then once they became no longer commercially viable in that sense, they look to storage as a way of taking it or of using the facility that they've already developed to get additional value out of it. But, so what this means is, is a lot of times the facilities, including the wells and the piping are going to be 50, 60, 70 years old. It's not uncommon for storage fields in the US, especially in the region I live in, which is called Appalachia, to, be, to have been discovered in the 20s and 30s to have been converted to storage in the 50s or 60s. So sometimes you'll have these wells that are approaching, you know, some will have casings that are over 50 years old, approaching 80, 90, 100 years. Um, obviously there's uh, a need at that point to go in and make sure you have well integrity, to run casing inspection logs, to do workovers, to plug wells, to squeeze cement and things like that. But it's important to recognize the life cycle of a storage field. When we talk about aquifers, it's basically the exact same thing as reservoirs, but you have a, a big plus and a big minus. The big advantage is, is that with a um, aquifer, you have the water drive mechanism that's gonna provide additional pressure support. As you deplete your um, gas in place, you're gonna get influx from water that's gonna provide that water drive and it's gonna increase your production because you don't lose back pressure as fast. The problem is, is you're also gonna produce a lot of excess water and that's gonna complicate your productions, especially remembering that in the US, the primary use of natural gas storage is for residential heating. So the most times you're gonna be withdrawing gas is going to be during the winter, which is obviously a cold ambient temperature months. Um, and then you're gonna have issues with freeze offs and hydrates and things of that nature. Um, and then when we talk about reservoir storage, not only are we talking about primary porosity, but we can also have secondary porosity facilities. So where we have natural fracturing or things like that, um, both of those are applicable. These are essentially the 10 biggest things that when you're, when you're talking about a reservoir storage application, if you don't have these 10 things, you're not going to have a viable a storage facility. So first and foremost is property rights. It's just like any other oil and gas operation. You have to have the legal right to uh, develop the facility. But the difference is, is that at least here in the US, while um, the mineral owner owns the uh, royalty rights for the actual oil or gas that may be in place, it's the surface owner who owns the pore space itself. Um, and so a storage lease is going to be much less lucrative and much, it's not going to generate as much money for the landowner simply because you're not paying a royalty because you're not producing anything from the poor space. You're just renting the capacity of the poor space itself. So it's a little bit of a intricacy, but it's important to recognize the difference. You need to have that closed reservoir. Like I said, if you don't have integrity of your reservoir, if you have potential spill points and migratory pathways, you are not going to have a successful operation. You need porosity and permeability and you need both of them. Um, but also remember that what makes for an effective production Porosity and permeability may not match in a storage environment because the storage environment, we're looking for much higher rates of delivery 
than just traditional production wells because we're charging these facilities up every year in terms of pressure. So we need to make sure they're capable of delivering a high rate. We're gonna need both base gas and working gas. And we'll talk about this more later on, but you're gonna need both the gas from a customer or from your own standpoint that you're gonna be cycling in and out every season, as well as the base gas that provides that pressure, especially in the case of a non aquifer because you don't have that water drive to lean on. Adequate number of wells is important. It doesn't matter if you have great geology, if you don't have enough wells within the reservoir to provide the rate that's necessary, you're not gonna be able to meet your market and it's not gonna be a commercial success. And along that same line, you're gonna need an adequate amount of compression and an adequate amount of pipe and an adequate sizing of pipe and a convenient configuration of your surface network to make sure that you can connect all your wells, not have any choke points and deliver all of the gas um, on surface, not just from the reservoir itself. You're gonna need peak day deliverability. Peak day, also referred to as design day, is the metric by which gas uh, storage service is sold. So it's effectively the rate, um, it's, it, it differs on how it's, it's defined, but basically it's, it's what the um, storage operator defines as on the most critical day of the calendar year, this is what our storage facility is capable of, of delivering. And it's and if you can't meet that market, then you're not really gonna have an effective storage uh, facility because you can't market your facility, you can't market your service to potential customers and make it economically viable. So it's not just about providing a base load service. We're gonna give you, we're gonna provide, you know, 50 million cubic feet a day, every day for the winter. That's not necessarily how it works. You also need to be able to ramp up that service and reach that peak day level on those coldest days of the year, on those most cr critical demand days um, so that your customers can, can again, benefit from that reliability because that's what they're really paying for. You need to have good measurement. Measurement is the cash register of gas storage. If you don't have good measurement, then you're not going to have good economics because you're going to assume that you, if, if you don't measure it correctly, you're going to assume you have losses that are geologic in nature or something like that. You need to be able to track the quantities in storage. And more important than any of all the rest of this, even more important than closure, is a market. You need to have a supply market to source the commodity and you need to have a demand market that's going to require the need for that excess capacity you're developing. If there's nobody who needs that extra gas um, when you're, uh, then there's no point in building the facility, right? So in, in, in the US, like I said, there's a lot of, of uh, residential heating needs, a lot of gas-fired power plants that need this. So you need to have that in proximity in order to look into developing a storage reservoir. From a geology standpoint, we mentioned how reservoir closure is, is critical. It's, it's important for any uh, oil and gas production, but in the case of E&P world, we're never getting back to a discovery pressure. So we don't really care if it has, you know, we're, we're never gonna get close to frat gradient. We're never gonna get close to uh, overpressuring it um, from a, from a um, in situ standpoint outside of specific fracturing operations. But in the case of reservoirs we're, and storage, we're always gonna get back to that high pressure facility, uh, condition. So we need to make sure that it, it's integral. Um, also remember a lot of these historic fields when they were developed all the way back in the 20s and 30s, they didn't have seismic, they didn't have advanced um, you know, geologic models and things like that. They would just drill wells. And then if it was a dry hole, they would plug it. And if it was a producing hole, they would lay a pipeline to it. So a lot of these um, historic fields that were converted the boundaries of the field were just created by drawing a line around where, you know, here's where the pr producing wells were and here's where the dry holes are. And you just write a boundary in the middle. That's not a very scientific method, as you can imagine. So a lot has been done in recent years for a lot of facilities to go back and remap them. But we talk about the traps and the boundaries. It's just like any oil and gas operation. You can be bounded by a stratigraphic trap, a structural trap based on folding or faulting, or you can have an aquifer that's bound by a, a gas water contact. And here's just an example of that. I know for this audience, you probably don't need this, but just recognizing that the same things that, that create a good reservoir in the production sense also um, provide a good uh, reservoir in the storage sense. Like I said, now we're gonna talk a little bit about the natural gas market specifically in the US. And again, this may not apply for everywhere, especially for those of you who are joining in the Middle East who don't have the same seasonal challenges. I mean, if you don't have a strong winter and you don't have a historic need for uh, natural gas for that sense, then this isn't gonna apply directly. 
but the concept still makes sense. It's still about the supply and demand economics um, and how that pans out. So this is again, just a good case study. So when we look at the US, here's where all the storage facilities are and their different types. You can see most of the, the storage capacity is up in uh, this area of the country. Um, you can't see my cursor, but basically up to the Northeast where you see all the depleted fields in their um, lighter uh, shaded circles up in Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. But then you also see a lot of salt down along the US Gulf Coast. Uh, and then there's a variety of just um, independent fields around the country. The other big um, cluster is there in the center of the, of the map in the state of Illinois. Um, which are the depleted aquifers. So the Illinois Basin, as it's called, is the geologic um, area, which is predominantly um, uh, susceptible or provides most of the aquifer storage in the country. So that's where it is geographically. And the reason this is important to show is that you'll notice that there's a tremendous amount of depleted reservoirs up here in the Northeast. And I always, if we were doing this live, I would always ask people, you know, why do you think that is? And everyone has a lot of different guesses, but the reason is very simple. We talked about markets, right? So the biggest market is residential heating. So where are the largest population centers in the US? Well, there's New York City, there's Washington DC, there's Philadelphia, there's Baltimore, uh, there's Boston. All of those are with, within a, a few hundred miles of each other over here on the US East Coast, which is directly east of where you see all of those depleted reservoirs. And the reason is, is because that's as close as you can get to that in market where those where those households are going to be using that natural gas to heat their homes in the winter. But that's as close as you can get and still have the geology to have this kind of formation. The Appalachian Mountains actually run up diagonally right along this trend where we see these, um, these, these fields. And so beyond that to the east, there really isn't a, a, a convenient geology to allow for that. So you're placing your facilities as close as you can to your end market. So that's, why, that's what's really driving it. Geology is driving it a little bit, but there's a lot of places around the country where we have good geology and we don't need storage because we don't have the markets, right? So it's always important to remember the market. This shows the highlight of the top per, uh, uh, top, top um, gas storage states in the US. And it's not important for you to know any of these, but you see some of the traditional oil and gas states like Texas and Louisiana, but then you also see states like Michigan, Pennsylvania that are in the Appalachian region we talked about close to the market. But what I want you to focus on here is the third, fourth, and fifth columns. And you can see the breakdown of the different types of facility around the country. And you can see the different levels in terms of the quantity, right? So a lot of depleted reservoirs, very few aquifers, all of which are in Illinois, and then uh, a comparable no small number of salt facilities, again, because of the localized geology that we talked about, right? So this just gives you a, an idea of the breakdown amongst the three main types of storage that we're talking about. Again, we don't use hard rock caverns for gas storage because it's not, uh, it doesn't provide the containment that we need. And when we're talking about the deposition here, um, we're, there's a lot of information on this uh, chart, but the, the main things I want you to take away are you can see from the depleted reservoirs and aquifers that you have a wide range of depths um, and of um, and the main thing on the depleted reservoirs is to recognize you can have some very shallow formations that are only a couple hundred feet deep and a couple hundred psi and top pressure, all the way to having facilities that are over ten thousand feet deep and have three thousand feet. Some of the um, Niagara Reef depositions up in Michigan um, can get up to about 3,000 pounds as a reservoir, which is very impressive. Aquifers are always going to be much more shallower than depleted reservoir pairs on average. Embedded salts and domal salts are going to be a little bit deeper. And in terms of pressures, on again, any specific facility may may differ, but on average, you're going to see a lot higher pressures than your salts very low pressures in your aquifers because they're much shallower and a variety of ranges in between for your depleted reservoirs. Now, when we talk about capacity and deliverability, this is where it kind of gets interesting. It's not surprising that the majority of our working gas capacity is going to be in depleted reservoirs because there's simply more of them. And as we talked about, they're larger and it's, and it's if you have a larger facilities in a higher quantity, you're going to have more of a total capacity. And the deliverability is also going to be higher simply because of that same volume, right? We have more facilities, the bigger, we're gonna have a lot more deliverability. Aquifers and, and salt caverns much less on both capacity, on both 
metrics, especially in terms of salt for capacity, just because there's fewer of them and there are smaller facilities because they're not these widespread geologic formations, it's those domal salts. Now, when we talk about as a percentage, that's where it's interesting. Even though we have 85% of storage capacity being housed in reservoirs, it only provides 72% of the deliverability across the nation. And if you look at the salt, it's the opposite, only 5% of capacity, but almost one out of every five cubic feet of delivery comes from a salt cavern. So that's where you see it's very efficient, it's very lucrative, uh, but again, we don't have the opportunities everywhere in the country to do that. That's why you don't see as much of it. So uh, just interesting to understand the differences between their performance and their effectiveness. And then we talk about the total capacity that we turn over in a year here in the US, and this is the most updated information from the federal government. You can see that we turn over a good, you know, it, it, two to two and a half BCF of gas every year. And we have a total storage capacity of about 4 trillion cubic feet. And last year we hit that target. We basically got to that total capacity across the country because some of the pandemic related uh, shortfalls on demand uh, allowed for additional storage. So basically all the storage was full, but you see every year we turn over a significant amount of this. This just shows how critical gas storage is to the US energy infrastructure. Now, when we talk about commercial usage of gas, it's important to understand how this economic model works is basically in the summer, we have our production, but we don't have a need for it because of a, lo a lower industrial load historically. Than we've, or, that we've seen historically. And because in summer months, we don't have a lot of uh, direct use of natural gas for heating. But in the winter, we have a much higher need for demand as the Northeast and the American Midwest gets cold. You need a lot more gas to provide that heat, but we don't have enough localized supply in terms of production to meet that. So we've got to store that gas in the summer when we have a period of oversupply so that we can withdraw it in the winter when we have a period of high demand. Um, and so that's basically that simple kind of arbitrage model is how we, um, is why we've had such a significant uh, gas storage infrastructure in the US is because that's a very well-defined business model and there's a very critical need from our utility customers and from the population in general. So that's what really drives it here and storage not only provides that commodity um, supply, but it also provides reliability, it provides operators to have flexibility as they can use their storage in case there's a disconnect on their pipeline or some kind of interruption with production. It just provides a lot more a peace of mind uh, and commercial uh, viability. One thing that's interesting is that we see this, this uh, line that I've added to the graph here is this started about, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago in earnest while I, uh, when I was still young in my career with storage is we started to see an increase in the amount of withdrawals that were requested during the peak of the summer, sometimes being net withdrawals, sometimes just being a, a decrease in the overall injections. And the reason that was is because once it would get to a certain heat level in the US, around 85 degrees Fahrenheit, we would start seeing a lot of gas-fired power plants come online to generate electricity because of air conditioning needs, right? So as you can see, we're starting to see a, a two peak um, calendar where we're seeing not just only peak um, strong demand in the winter, which is intuitive, but we're seeing a lot of uh, demand in the middle of the summer because of, as we see more and more gas fired power plants being built, um, that's, that's going to lean on the storage facilities as well. Um, so it's very interesting to kind of see how that um, has, how storage operations have adapted to that and how they need to change to make sure that they can still meet markets even with that complication. But as you can see here, the main takeaway is all of this is weather driven. I talked a, bit, a little bit before about the difference between working gas and base gas. This is an important concept to understand. Um, it's not universal to the, to the entire globe, but it is important in the US. Your native gas is basically gonna be everything from zero PSI to whatever the abandonment pressure of your reservoir was. So when they produced as much gas as they could and it became economically uh, unviable to do any more, that say that's 100 pounds, 200 pounds, whatever it may be. So from zero to 100 pounds is going to be your native gas. That's considered part of your plant. You're not going to be able to get it back out, but it's still there. It's still occupying pore space. It's still providing back pressure. 
your base gas is whatever gas from that 100 pounds to whatever minimum threshold you determine based on whatever your commercial factors are that is needed to provide that back pressure so that you can cycle the working gas, which is everything above that, in and out of the reservoir every year. It should go without saying that you can't cycle these facilities all the way from max pressure all the way down to abandonment pressure every year because the amount of horsepower that you would need to pump that, the amount of time that you would need to do that is just not viable for an economic uh, business, right? So you need to provide some amount of base gas that will prop that up to whatever kind of minimum pressure threshold you need to cycle that working gas. That's usually, um, that base gas is usually, or I should say that threshold is usually determined by your delivery pressures, by your compression, by localized pipeline pressures, so that there's a, a reasonable amount of spread that can be maintained uh, because you want to be able to cycle all of your working gas. You don't want to be limited and only turn over a certain amount of it. Um, so that's important to recognize. In the case of the U.S., the working gas is owned by the customer. The base and native gas is owned by the storage operator. So you're never actually taking ownership of the gas when it's delivered into your storage facility. You're just taking receipt of it, and it's still retained in terms of ownership by the customer who bought the storage service. When we talk about operating the storage fields themselves, it's important to recognize that every field, no matter how similar they are to each other, does need to be operated independently because there are a ton of different variations that will change how you, how you do things. In some fields, you'll want to inject in certain areas and withdraw from different areas in order to control migration. Other fields, you might use every single well or not. Some fields, you flow in and out of both on withdrawal and injection. Sometimes you inject with compression, but you flow out. Sometimes you have fields that we want to prioritize for refilling, even during the withdrawal season because of their high performance. Some have water and other produce fluids, some produce um, um, oil, some have paraffin issues, things like that. It's just important to recognize that there isn't a copy and paste solution in terms of your storage operations. It's very, it's very experiential and it's very specific to that, that uh, individual geologic formation and storage operation. I've had storage fields that were literally right next to each other in the same county, um, and they operated very differently because of water saturations, right? So it's just important to recognize that they're all universal, but no matter how you operate your facility, remembering again, it's always gonna be driven by the weather, at least in the US model. So when we talk about why, so let's talk about why this would be of value to people. Uh, or who it would be of value to. So again, the, the owners and operators of these that, that can make a lot of money off of gas storage is your pipeline companies, utilities and local distribution companies, which is what an LDC stands for, that are actually supplying that end natural gas to the customer. Um, independent storage companies, which are just like pipeline companies, except they don't have the large national infrastructure. And gas marketers and investment, um, these are entities over the last 10 years, basically since 2008, as we saw massive spreads between current pricing and futures pricing, a lot of private equity and capital came in to basically play the arbitrage market. But unlike a financial transaction that happens on paper, in the storage world, if you wanna, if you wanna buy low and sell high, you have to take ownership and physically store the molecule somewhere. So that's where storage comes in as a critical need. Um, and the services, it's not just the storage capacity, but you can also take, in, it, take advantage of what a term is called parking and lending, which allows the storage operator to basically take unused capacity and then market it by themselves. So if I'm the storage operator and I have storage contracts that I've sold, if I'm not using certain capacities because people aren't filling up their storage or they've already emptied it out, I can use that extra space to purchase gas for myself and then sell it in the future you know, uh, if it's going to be a, uh, if there's going to be a good arbitrage market to make some money and the government allows that as long as it doesn't impact your, your customer contracts. So those are the different ways that money is made and, and money is made basically in two ways, intrinsic and extrinsic values, which I know are some uh, complicated words, but basically intrinsic value is if we look at the calendar year and the price of natural gas that we see here on the graph, if I buy a contract for gas in April, for delivery in July, whatever the price is here, and then I store it over that time, as it goes up into July, whatever the difference in price is, is the intrinsic value. I bought low, I sold high, just like the stock market, and I'm gonna make a profit based on whatever that margin is. 
But the extrinsic value is the idea that you can cycle that facility multiple times a year. And even if you, you do have that contract in July, if you leave that, if you um, don't decide to take that receipt of that gas at that point or delivery of that gas, if that price would then fluctuate, you could then sell it off even further in the future at a higher point and make even more profit. So again, it's just arbitrage, it's just buy low, sell high, but it's important to recognize that there's different ways you can capitalize on that. And finally, the last thing I'll talk about commercial value of gas storage is, is that when we sell service, you sell basically two, uh, two types of service, firm service and interruptible service. And they mean exactly what they sound like. Firm service is um, highest priority and it's paid at a premium. And basically it means you are at the top of the list if there is some kind of critical day where there is an issue with supply and, you, and everybody's making a run on their storage contracts, um, firm service will not be interrupted. Whereas interruptible service is sold at a discount, but during those critical times, um, you may have your service cut off uh, simply because, um, you know, it's the storage industry is a lot like the airline industry, right? So oftentimes you will overbook in the sense that you will sell a service based on a metric, but if everybody maxes out all their contracts at the exact same time, you may have trouble meeting that demand. That doesn't happen all the time, but in cases where it does happen, the firm customers get priority, the interruptible customers don't, and that's reflected in the price of these services. So if you're a distribution company, if you're providing gas to residents, you're always going to be a firm service customer. But interruptible service can be bought by those lower tier, like those marketers we talked about who don't have that same obligation. And within those buckets, you basically have three different types of service as well. You basically have your daily storage quantity, your contract quantity, and your commodity charges. And these are somewhat confusing in terms of the wording. But let me give you an example like this. Imagine we have a trucking company and a warehouse, right? So we provide storage and transportation of whatever item in the world it may be. Let's say it's a drill pipe, right? Just since we're an oil and gas audience. So the storage quantity is the charge for the warehouse. Your customer says, hey, I've got this drill pipe. I'm going to need it delivered, but I need you to store it until it, the time comes. So the, the storage quantity is the warehousing fee that we charge for the facility where we store that, store that drill pipe. The contract quantity is the, is the transportation aspect of it. So that would be the costs associated with the trucks that you may have or the trains and the rail cars that you may have in order to transport that from your warehouse, from your storage facility to the end user. And the commodity charge is what you get, what you charge the customer for actually using the capacities in the previous two iterations because they can buy warehouse space, they can buy trucking capacity, but they may not be using it all the time. But when they actually do use it, you incur additional costs, right? You've got to pay truck drivers and train operators. You've got to pay for fuel. You've got to pay for all those other kind of operational costs that may not necessarily be part of the just leasing warehouse space or leasing the trucks, right? So all of that goes into play. And that's how, we, that's how the U.S. market makes money off of gas storage. So as we close up here, before we take questions, I, I'm, I know I'm probably running a little, well, kind of on pace. But um, so especially in the US, but also around the world, we're seeing a lot more discussion about uh, st gas storage and just underground energy storage in general. These are some of the big uh, topics that came up in the US, some headlines. The main one down here, as you may know, uh, Warren Buffett, which is one of the wealthiest men in the world, um, his group Berkshire Hathaway purchased Dominion Energy, which is the second largest natural gas storage operator and pipeline in the US last year. $4 billion, which signaled, at least to me, that they were putting a lot of value on the existing infrastructure in terms of pipeline and storage facilities. Um, so obviously there is a, a, a very critical need for that as the smart money is, put, is being put on that. Um, we also had up here on the right, this failure out at a facility in California called Aliso Canyon. There was a storage failure and it resulted in there being a lot more um, new regulations put on storage operators by the federal government. So that's very uh, fresh in everyone's mind. And I already mentioned how last year in the U.S. Um, we ran out of above ground storage capacity for crude oil. Um, and that's what caused the futures to dip negative for a short period of time. Um, and that's why storage is being more prevalent uh, for hydrocarbons, because people are wondering how could something like ha that happen? How can we stop that from happening in the future? And then when we talk about new drivers, we're talking about things like, um, you know, ESG, we're talking about the push or the desire for renewable energy. 
and different ways that the oil and gas um, uh, industry can be part, can participate in that. And so we're seeing a lot more discussion of CO2 sequestration. We're seeing a lot more discussion of hydrogen. We're talking about a lot more about LNG, both importing and exporting. And all of those will require storage as a piece of this. So it's important. For, the reason I wanted to talk about this is even though a lot of times people are um, talking about the future of oil and gas in a negative sense, which I think is overstated, if I'm being honest, because we'll certainly be using oil and gas for, for many decades to come globally. Um, there are opportunities within the oil and gas sector in the storage and midstream section um, that will still rely on your or still take use of your traditional oil and gas petroleum engineering background, but in a slightly different mode in terms of carbon sequestration, hydrogen storage, and just regular hydrocarbon storage as well. Um, so like I said, around the, this is, even though we talked a lot about the U.S., and I apologize for that, and knowing this is an international audience, but obviously that's where my expertise comes from, storage is very critical to the global markets, not just for um, the heating use we talked about, but for strategic purposes and for industrial purposes. Um, and as we see the new changes to our social license in terms of the way that we operate and how, um, you know, politics and, and investor relations and things like that are pushing to, to a cleaner and a more, um, you know, environmentally friendly approach to our energy needs. Um, there are some opportunities for, for gas storage, uh, especially in the terms of flaring. Uh, flaring of gas is not looked at favorably, and I've always hated flaring just because it was a waste, right? But now if we can take advantage of that gas that we would normally flare and store it, that's an opportunity. Hydrogen, as we've talked about several times, is one of the real um, opportunity areas uh, in trying to meet the needs of the environmental mindset while also doing it at scale. Um, because it, hydrogen burns very cleanly, but we talked about the challenges it has in terms of storage. So there's a lot of work to be done there. And then obviously carbon sequestration continues to be a big player in all of this. Um, and it's um, being prompted by a lot of tax credits and government subsidies that make it kind of lucrative. So there's a lot of opportunity there too. And I wanna talk just a little bit about strategic reserves um, because that's something that's uh, coming up. A lot of countries around the globe are developing strategic reserves. And we saw this, uh, you know, we saw this in the first Gulf War uh, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. And we're seeing it now off the back of, of COVID is where you're seeing interruptions in the supply chain, right? And so a lot of countries are starting to realize we can't afford to be, to have our supplies of oil and gas um, cut off or reduced in order to, without having major economic impact. So how can we develop our own strategic reserves to be able to have those extra capacities on hand in case of these emergencies? So right now, over 4 billion barrels of crude oil storage and strategic reserves exist around the globe. And if you think about that, it's a pretty <laughs> significant amount of, of capacity. And that represents about 40 days of service globally based on the, the localized consumption rates at those facilities, right? So basically the world has built 40 days of capacity for their oil and gas out of the strategic reserves and we're continuing to add on that. Um, so basically the target for the International Energy Agency is 90 days of service based on your localized consumption rates. So that's what the target is. It's not always attainable, but that's what the goal is when we develop these. And, and to support these, not just with your, store, your storage itself, there are oil sharing agreements and other diplomatic arrangements so that if certain countries can't necessarily develop all the storage capacity they need, they certainly have other commercial arrangements with other uh, countries to take advantage of that. So that's a lot of information I know, but hopefully that gives you an insight into underground storage. It's something that has been utilized for generations, both here in the US and around the world, but it's something that not only do the, the average citizen not really understand or know about, but the average person in the oil and gas industry doesn't really know much about it either because it's such a niche operation. But as we talked about, it's incredibly important. And if it wasn't for gas storage, a lot of um, utilities would not be able to survive. A lot of commercial industries would not be able to survive. And a lot of strategic you know, um, government security related issues would not be able to be addressed if it wasn't for, for the storage opportunities we have. And so hopefully this gives you some good insight, hopefully maybe encourages you to look into midstream and gas storage as a potential career path for those of you that are still looking for opportunities because there is a lot of growth 
in this sector and there's not a lot of storage expertise out there. Um, so hopefully this is a good opportunity for those of you who might be interested. And with that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator and I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Engineer Zachary, for this super informative webinar. We have just one question. Do we have examples of uh, simultaneous occurrence of production and storage in different wells of same reservoir? Um, so the answer is yes. I mean, that, that has happened, but it's incredibly rare. And usually what happens is it's not during active production, it's during secondary production. So what you'll have is you will have a depleted reservoir, usually that's oil bearing, and then it will be converted for natural gas storage, but there's enough residual, residual crude oil that when you're producing the natural gas, it will produce enough oil that you can, um, number one, it'll cause problems because you'll have to separate it out and things like that. So you might have specific production wells within the facility that are designed to kind of pull off that residual oil. Um, and, and that usually sits in different pockets of the reservoir, it's not uniform. Um, so sometimes you'll see that kind of uh, commingled production uh, with storage operations, but it's very unusual to have an active production field and then be storing somewhere else, unless you're talking about enhanced oil recovery, in which case you're storing, you know, you're either steam flooding or you're storing carbon or in some cases nitrogen, although that's a, a waste in my opinion. Sometimes you will store that CO2 and it will push um, you know, your, your hydrocarbons out to your production wells, but it's not very common and I do not recommend it outside of those specific circumstances. Thank you. Uh, we have another question, which is what happened if there is, there is an earthquake to the underground storage gas? Do this case happen previously? Um, so I don't remember a case in which an act, an, a, exactly an earthquake caused a lack of containment um, but it is common. I mean, it's it's just like any other kind of facility. I mean, when there's massive tectonic activity, you're going to have damage both to your surface system and potentially to your, your downhole structure as well. Um, the closest thing I can think of is out west in California, where that, that major uh, leak happened a couple of years ago that caused a lot of the new regulations. That part of the country, because it is a long the San Andreas Fault, which is the most active fault in the U.S., there is a lot of structural um, folding, a lot of faulting over there. So it's the earthquakes themselves may not actually cause a failure, but the historic earthquakes have caught, and that tectonic pressure has caused a lot of the um, structural changes, which have formed the reservoirs themselves. So you always have to worry about those conduits in terms of is the fault sealing or not. Am I going to have naturally occurring fractures that are going to allow for escape of gas to surface? And more importantly, if I have those, I have to be very concerned about my well integrity to make sure I have good integrity behind the pipe in terms of my cement jobs to make sure that I'm not allowing that conduit to surface, even if it exists in the reservoir. So no direct failure um, that I can, I can point to from uh, an earthquake specifically. But yeah, I mean, you certainly are susceptible to that. And we all just have to, uh, to hope that that doesn't necessarily happen where we have these large storage facilities. Thank you. Our last question is, compared to conventional storage in terms of economic, which one has the least budget to store the gas? Um, so the most effective in terms of um, cost, just overall cost is probably salt caverns simply because a salt cavern requires the minimum amount of surface facilities, right? So you you only need one well, and it's going to be a big well, and there's going to be a lot of pipe in it, and you're going to need some, a lot of safety mechanisms on top. And you're going to need a certain amount of compression because you are operating at a very high pressure. But, I mean, one well and one pipeline and some, uh, you know, gas treatment for that and compression for that is a lot easier than a depleted reservoir, which sometimes has hundreds of wells. The largest storage field I've operated personally has over 400 storage wells. Um, so you imagine the costs of 400 wells and pipe and the maintenance thereof. And you, again, you still have surface facilities, still have gas treatment, you still have compression, you still have the station. And more importantly, the base gas ratio when it comes to salt caverns is much lower 
than in a reservoir. So in a reservoir, you usually have close to a one-to-one -one ratio between base gas and the working gas. So for every cubic feet of gas that you can market, um, that you can cycle in and out and actually make money off of, you have to have a cubic foot of gas or close to it in the ground constantly that you've purchased to provide the back pressure. For salt claverins, that's closer to two to one. So you have less plant costs when it comes to your base gas. So I'd say salt caverns is the most economically viable, but again, it's the most geographically restrictive because you're at the mercy of geology as to whether or not you have salt domes you can take advantage of. Reservoirs would be second and hard rock mines are very expensive because mining is just, is just an expensive operation. Thank you. Thank you so much, engineer Zachary again. And now, to highlight, this session has been recorded and will be uploaded soon on Biopatra YouTube channel. So kindly make sure to subscribe on our channel. Wishing you a great day and bye. Thank you.